Welcome to the Rothko Chapel. I am Caitlin Farrell and I'm the Visitor Services Manager and Communications Coordinator here at the Chapel. I've been here for about four and a half years now. I actually um, majored in art history and religion in college, so this felt like a very appropriate place for me to be, a place that's dedicated to interfaith connections and dialogue, but is also a sacred art space for people of all walks of life to come and experience the work of Mark Rothko. So we're standing in front of the other half of the Rothko Chapel, which is the Broken Obelisk Sculpture by Barnett Newman. The sculpture was designed between 1964 and 1967 by Barnett Newman, who is a contemporary of Mark Rothko's in the Abstract Expressionist movement. The Damonills were working closely with the University, or sorry, with the City of Houston to create more public art spaces around the city and wanted to um, purchase a sculpture that would be placed in front of the Houston City Hall in downtown. They were working with the Municipal Art Commission who would pay for half of the sculpture while the Damon Mills would pay for the other half. They visited the foundry in which the obelisk was made and decided that this would be the perfect piece to bring to the city of Houston. They found it in 1969, which was the year after MLK was assassinated and really were passionate about advocacy for human rights and social justice and wanted to create a space that would be in memory of him. And so they decided in, um, in gifting this sculpture to the city of Houston, they wanted it to be donated in the memory of MLK and dedicated to his legacy here. So a visible monument to MLK in Houston. The city of Houston was not in favor of that dedication. They said they would accept the sculpture, but not the dedication. The Damonills felt that it was so important to keep that dedication and a space honoring MLK in the city that they uh, decided to purchase the sculpture outright. And instead of locating it in uh, front of the city hall in downtown Houston, to put it in front of the obel or in front of the chapel here. So it is what we consider to be the second half of the chapel's mission. First, experiencing a contemplative, meditative environment inside where you're able to get in touch with your spirituality and your um, voice and what means most to you. And then being faced with the obelisk when you come out and being called to action for civil rights and social justice and to create a world where all are treated with dignity and respect. So we are now inside the Rothko Chapel. It was founded in 1971 by French-born philanthropists and art patrons John and Dominique de Manil. That name might be recognizable to you since we are also right next to the Manil Collection, which was um, one of the most well-known museums in Houston. They were also instrumental in creating and supporting the vibrant arts culture that we know in Houston today. The de Manils came here in 1941 from France and worked closely with the University of St. Thomas to develop a comprehensive campus plan for the university. They decided to bring on uh, modern architect Philip Johnson, whose name you also may recognize from um, his famous glass house in Connecticut, or a number of other buildings that he's designed around the Houston area. And as part of this campus plan, they wanted to create a chapel. The University of St. Thomas is a private Catholic institution, and of course, having a chapel on campus available for its students is very important to them. The Domini or Dominique and John de Manil were very influenced by the work of uh, a Dominican priest in France named Father Marie Alain Couturier, who developed a number of sacred spaces with contemporary artists, such as the Matisse Chapel in Vence, France, and the Le Corbusier Chapel in Ronchamp. All right, to give you a little background on Mark Rothko, he was born in present-day Latvia in early 1900s before his parents and his family immigrated to the United States where he spent most of his youth in Portland, Oregon. Um, after that, he moved to Connecticut to attend Yale University, uh, though he only spent one year there before moving to New York City to pursue a career as an artist. When people think of Mark Rothko, much of what comes to mind is his abstract expressionist work of vibrant color field paintings. Um, color field meaning there aren't recognizable figures necessarily in the artwork, but they're more of studies in these different hues and different shades of color. His mission was really to evoke these essential human emotions that all of us experience 
and give space for people to explore those through his paintings. What we see in the chapel is his specific commission from Dominique and John de Manil to create a space that was sacred and meditative through his artwork. Mark Rothko received the commission for the Rothko Chapel in 1964 and worked on the paintings between 1964 and 1967. He did them completely in his studio in New York on 69th Street, which was a converted carriage house that had a large open skylight in the center of the room that was able to flood the, flood the space with natural lighting. He actually built a mock up of three of the chapel walls in his studio to scale so that he was able to place the paintings exactly how they would be in the chapel and maneuver them with a system of pulleys to mimic their exact placement. He also had a parachute that he hung below the skylight that he was able to move back and forth to uh, manipulate how they were lit in the space as well. Mark Rothko worked very closely with Philip Johnson to design almost every aspect of the chapel from the shape of the building, which is an octagon. This allowed the viewer to be completely surrounded by his paintings when they were inside, to the paving stones that are on the floor. They reminded Mark Rothko of the pavers that are in Central Park in New York, which was his favorite place to walk and have a meditative, contemplative walking experience. He also designed the guardrails that are in front of the paintings, which help you identify the ideal place to stand in relation to them. He did like his viewers to stand very close to the artwork so that it completely filled their field of vision and allowed you to feel pulled into the space, into the artwork, and in a deeper conversation with it. So over the last 18 months, the chapel has actually gone through a major restoration project called our Opening Spaces Campaign. It actually includes a master site plan redevelopment, um, but centering on the restoration of the chapel itself. Ever since the chapel opened in 1971, um, the lighting solution has always been a bit problematic. Uh, Mark Rothko died in 1970 and was unfortunately never able to come to Houston to see his paintings officially installed in the chapel or to help configure the way the lighting should be designed. He insisted on having a skylight that was similar to the one that he had in his studio where he created the artwork. He felt that that was the most ideal viewing of the paintings. However, the light that we have here in Houston is quite different from the light that they experience in New York City. It's a bit harsher. Um, so with the completely open skylight that they had in the early 1970s, it flooded the room with light. Um, the light went mostly downward uh, rather than out. So the paintings were left in the dark uh, for the most part, not really easy to see. And in any case, it wasn't an ideal lighting situation. And since then, um, there have been a number of undertakings to correct that lighting and bring it back to a place that's safe for the conservation of the paintings and provides an ideal viewing situation for them. And so over the past year and a half, we have um, redesigned the lighting in the space, removed the deflection baffle that used to hang under the skylight, so it allows a much more even light to flood the space, but also protects it from the harmful UV rays that come through with the Texas sun. So now I want to share a little bit about the life of the chapel. Um, the Rothko Chapel, as I mentioned, has been open to the public for people to come in and experience the art and get a connection with their spirituality since 1971, but it's also an active space. We hold a number of public programs each year. Our mission is dedicated to exploring the intersection of art, spirituality, and human rights. So our programming explores that connection as well. We hold concerts, we hold um, colloquia and symposia that discuss the major human rights issues of the day. And we do a number of religious services, including um, an interface Thanksgiving service that we hold each year. that has been going on for over 35 years now um, with about nine different faith communities around Houston. People are also welcome to hold um, celebrations of life and religious or significant moments um, in the chapel, including weddings and memorial services, baptisms. And the chapel has also always been available to local religious communities who may not have a space of their own, but would like to hold their services here.
I'm Jack Cagle, and I have the privilege of serving you as the Commissioner of Harris County Precinct 4. And today, I want to thank you for joining us on our Encore Excursions. This is our way of getting you, our friends, our folks that we seek to serve out and to be able to see the things that we used to be able to see together, but now safely and virtually. In the meantime, we hope to continue to bring other events and other excitement to you. Stay safe, stay well, and we hope to see you soon in person.